Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 14 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me is my partner, Pervez Ahmed. Good to be here, Zaki. Thank you. Uh, so, so Pervez, we, we've had a very uh, a busy couple of weeks with our last show. It, it only dropped uh, two weeks ago, but in that time, it's already become one of our top uh, episodes of all time. That's right. I think even, you know, yeah, you and I, I at least for me personally, I, I, I didn't imagine that it would, it would, it would sort of uh, just, you know, have that kind of a, uh, a draw among the audience. But, uh, of course, very happy that it did. Uh, well, it's and funny, I, mean, I, I take that as an indication that people are really responding to uh, you and me, our particular <laughs> charisma, the, the mix of uh, brain and brawn. You know, we're kind of we're kind of a Burns and Allen of our time, and I think people are responding to that. Um, so I'm very no, of course it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with our guest, who is Rabia Chaudhry, uh, and and her connection, of course, to the very very popular serial podcast, which opened us up to an entirely new audience. That's and, right. And as I said, we're we're extremely grateful for that. Right. I mean, you know, it's got its own sub sub Reddit, Reddit. So I don't even know how that thing works. But uh, yeah, it's definitely out there. Uh, uh, you and I were kind of talking about off air. You know, she was, uh, you know, Sarah Koenig was on um, on, on Stephen Colbert, Colbert this week. Colbert yeah. report. That's right. Yeah. 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 Which that show is leaving. So um, that's going to be. Yeah, that show about. that show is ending and serial is ending as well. However, we're not going anywhere. So. You'll That's still right. have us, audience. So I, I actually did want to point out uh, one message that we got in response to our last episode, and and uh, this was uh, this was received uh, anonymously. Uh, this was an amazing podcast, obviously for the serial discussion, but I loved it from a compassion and understanding standpoint. The Muslim American story is tough to really get at if you're unfamiliar. The media doesn't help at all, but it gave me such wonderful perspective and heart. And Rabia is phenomenal. So uh, to me, I, I, I want, I'm very grateful when we receive comments like that because it tells me that we're we are doing something right, and and we're we're uh, at least in in some small way we're making egress towards the the goal of our show. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was yeah. Uh, I, I I I saw that post and I was very uh, heartened by it. It was very nice feedback. So, but um, we're not going to we're not going to rest on our laurels because we've got a great uh, conversation to share with everyone today as well. And um, our guest for today's episode is Asif Manvi, who if you are, are familiar with The Daily Show, and I'm assuming many of our audience members are, then you already know well who Asif Manvi is. He is their, their senior Middle Eastern correspondent, the senior brown person at, at, at The Daily Show. <laughs> I would say now and, they have more than one, so we can't, you know. Yeah, he, he but he's, he's no longer he the soul. He, well, he has seniority, so that's right. Although I think Larry Wilmore might have been around longer than him. So, uh, but but regard and Larry Wilmore, by the way, will also be be getting his own uh, uh, Daily Show spinoff show after Colbert leaves. I heard that. Is that going? Is that is he going to fill the Colbert spot? Uh, yeah, it's going to be called the Nightly oh. Show, and it's going to follow the uh, the like the Daily Show. That's correct. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Okay, very yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was yeah, going to be called the the Minority Report was the original title. Oh, nice. Okay. Which would have been great, but uh, but they they went with the Nightly Show. Yeah, very nice. I wonder if you had to secure the rights to Minority Report. That that was I think that was part of the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Um, yeah. So no. It, yeah, it was great. Uh, uh, yeah, having Asif on was uh, was a real honor, and um, you know it was the good folks that. Uh, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, um, ISPU, uh, who is a uh, think tank, a Muslim think tank based in Michigan, although they have presented policy papers um, throughout the country at various conferences in various journals. Um, very exciting organization to sort of keep you know, keep keep track of. Um, uh, I was sort of uh, engaged with the organization a little bit when I lived in Michigan, spent some time with the founders, really good group of folks there. And they are growing as an organization. So um, we are really, again, very grateful to ISPU for uh, affording us the opportunity to have this conversation with Asif, uh, who was there in Michigan to um, be the keynote at their at their uh, gala, or is it gala? Uh, I think it's it's it's. I don't <laughs> this was know. a conversation that you and I had over Thanksgiving. That's why I kind and of. I, I don't think we've we've achieved resolution on that, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Right. It's a party, let's say. Uh, 
but but regardless, yeah, we we did get to to chat with him. And and for those of you who who, in addition to to the Daily Show, um, Asif has of course acted in a variety of things. Uh, first time I really became aware of him was in Spider Man Two. He was Mister Aziz, uh, which is the first time I saw him. He was also in The Last Airbender. He's been in a variety of different films, and uh, I, you know he certainly got a very unique and interesting perspective. So we're, we're very grateful to uh, have been able to have him share his perspective with us. So let's go ahead and play our kind. Conversation. So uh, we, we've got a lot to talk about. We've, we, we definitely want to talk about No Man's Land, and you have you No have, Land's Man. No, No Land's Man. Sorry. Start again. Start again. <laughs> we, we, we want to talk about No Land's Man as, uh, as, as our conversation continues. But I think <laughs> that's great. Thank you. <laughs> what, what, what might be helpful uh, as, as uh, we, we start is just to sort of get some background on your journey a little bit, because I think uh, that's, that's a big uh, part of, of the narrative that, that people have of you. So, so uh, where did you start? What do you consider the beginning of your journey? Uh, birth. Um, is probably the best place to to start with that. Um, so I was born, and then um, it was I was born in India, uh, and then uh, my parents moved to the UK when I was a year old, and, um, and then I lived in the UK till I was uh, in high school, and then moved to the United States, and um, and then New York, and you know, and have been sort of now living in New York for the past uh, 25 years or so. Uh, so that's sort of the geographic uh, journey. But uh, in, in terms of like, you know, what I, what I sort of talk about in the book uh, is a lot about sort of um, using that immigrant experience um, as a sort of template to talk about other things and to, you know, have a humorous take on uh the, the, the journey of how to navigate as a, a South Asian immigrant and a Muslim, you know, somebody who's raised Muslim in, uh, in, in, you know, firstly in England growing up and then, and then in, in America and then sort of a post 9-11 America. Well, and, and at what point did you sort of decide that you wanted to pursue what is a very non-traditional career path, especially in, in the Indian community? Uh, yeah, you know, I never, it, it was a decision that was made very early in childhood, and it was not a decision that I really uh, feel like I ever made. It was uh, it was just something that I knew that I wanted to do. It was a calling, you know. I wanted to be a performer. I wanted to act. I wanted to write. I wanted to uh, tell stories, and I wanted to, um, you know, pretend to be other people, I guess. Um, and so that really just... Sort of happened for me um, at a very young age, uh, you know, um, when I was uh, probably around 11, or 11, 12, 13, around that time. And did I mean I, I'd love to talk talk about sort of what you've encountered as far as dealing with tokenism and things like that? Because I mean, I mean, has that changed over the years? How how did you? Uh, sort of combat that that sense of wanting to be more than just a, a token um i don't know if i uh combated it in a very conscious way i think what i did was i just kept working on my craft and kept working on myself and 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 i actually started to uh to, to, to take things out of, uh, as much as you can in this business, I started to take things into my own control. So I, I, I started to write is, is what I mean. And I started to get up on stage and do stand up, for example, uh, which I was not very good at. But I ended up sort of attempting doing that for a while. And then and then I started writing characters inspired by my family because I was going out for these roles where I would. So basically, essentially be playing, you know. Um, uh, stereotypical uh, South Asian characters, cab drivers, or, you know, I mean, I tell a story in No Land's Man uh, about how one of my first auditions that I had in New York was about, it was going in for the role of a snake charmer. And, um, and the, the, the producers actually asked me if I knew how to snake charm. 
Um, <laughs> and and they said, you know, this is an awkward question, but we kind of need to ha- ask everyone, like, do you know how to snake charm? And I wanted the job so badly that I actually said, uh, I, I don't, but I, but I'm Indian. So it's probably in my DNA, and I could probably learn really fast. <laughs> just give me a day just, though. Because I really wanted this job. Wow. And so, you know, that was the experience. And, and, and I remember my friend Sakina Jaffrey and I used to have this term uh, that, that she actually coined that then we all started using, uh, which is Patenki. Again, I, I, I talk about it in the book where um, this idea that, like, when you go in for these roles – um, we always just say to each other, did they ask you to patank? And patank basically means going patank, 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 <laughs> which is the sound of the Indian accent from the perspective of a non-Indian Westerner, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so if they asked you to patank, then you knew that like that's what it was going to be, you know? Um, or did they not ask you to patank, you know? So I think that, you know, that was uh, the experience for a long time of uh, – of sort of being an actor in this business, being brown. Um, and and I think ultimately for me what it was, uh, the turning point came for me when I wrote my one-man show, Sakina's Restaurant, yeah. which where I decided to write characters who felt more nuanced and, um, you know, uh, complex and true uh, from the South Asian background from a uh, Muslim, Indian, South, you know, whatever background that I came from that was specific to me and, and the people I knew and grew up with. Um, and so I started writing those characters and then that sort of changed the, the nature of my career after that somewhat. Did you, did you, um, like it, right, right, like initially, did you uh, gravitate to comedy almost sort of like right off the bat, or did you, you know? I never, I never, you know, I've never thought of myself as a comedian. I've always thought of myself as an actor who does comedy, uh, mm. you know. But I also do drama, so uh, you know, I, I that that whole comedy drama thing has never, like, you know, when you go to acting school or you get. Right. You, degree in theater nobody's saying to you are you a comedian or are you a dramatic you know sometimes i mean yes there are comedians who got but i feel like for me like it was just all you know the same thing like it's always been the same thing yeah i mean like you mentioned sakina's restaurant i mean uh and then I, just thinking of some of your more dramatic performances although there's a lot of comedy in it i'm, I'm thinking of like today's special which i, I just yeah. love that movie i love that movie and, and i think that a lot of what we are talking about probably what you talk about in the book as well is sort of, you know, it, it is beautifully expressed in that movie. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, the movie Today's Special, yeah. uh, which was inspired by Sakina's Restaurant, the play that ah, I wrote. Okay. Um, you know, that movie really uh, is about the, the South Asian immigrant struggle as it existed in me. And, and you know, we, we sort of told the story in the context of an Indian restaurant and about this family that owns an Indian restaurant in Jackson Heights, yeah. uh, in, in Jackson Heights, Queens. And, and we sort of told it in the context of like, oh, it's a romantic comedy because, you know, we have to, you have to sell it to the marketplace, right? Um, and, but the, the, what that movie for me is really about is about the integration of the false self and the authentic self to some degree, as much as you can. Uh, and that, and, 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 you know, and that, and that could mean false self, authentic self. It could also mean like old, your, your ethnic roots versus like your more, um, you know, Western upbringing or, you know, it's about a man who basically is trying to be a French chef, Mm -hmm. um, and wants to be a French chef. He's an Indian guy who wants to be a French chef who ends up having to take over his father's Indian restaurant when his father has a heart attack and learns about his own food by way of having to navigate back into his own culture that he has rejected. So the movie is really about the integration of those two parts of this man in order for him to become a whole person, you know? Um, and, and so uh, that is a metaphor for what has happened to me and continues to happen to me. And, and I think for a lot of, uh, for the immigrant story in many ways, you know? Absolutely. Right. And, and I think for a lot of the, like, uh, like listeners who may not be familiar with uh, 
with some of the actors in the movie, I mean, you have some real actors, actors from, you know, from Bollywood, right? I mean, these- well, I mean, we got, we were, we were very happy to get uh, the great Nasruddin Shah. That's right. To, uh, to play one of the, uh, you know, I mean, he steals the movie. I mean, I'm the, I'm the lead, but he steals the movie from me, you know, um, and he's, he's brilliant in the, in the role of Akbar, the, the Indian chef who basically comes in and teaches me about you know, life and spice and cooking and, you know, um, and uh, we got Madhu Jafri, of course, who everybody uh, is familiar with and is also a terrific actress as well as being sort of a cookbook impresario and uh, Harish Patel. Um, who's he plays it? your father, right? He plays my father. He's a terrific Bollywood actor. Yeah, huge. Um, I mean, like big television sort of dramatic. Big television actor. guy, yes. So, you know, we got, the, we got, and then we've got people like uh, uh, Dean Winters and Jess Wexler, who is a terrific actress, and uh, Ajay Naidu, who people know, and, you know, and, and just, uh, we got, we had a great um, ensemble uh, cast of really terrific actors. So it's funny, you know, like I know you're you're born in Bombay or Mumbai. Uh, I actually lived lived there about two and a half years. Um, I was born in the states, but we moved back for a little bit. Yeah. And uh, funny story, sort of intersection again. Um, and, and when I was in Bombay, I went to school with Nasruddin Shah's jo- daughter. Yeah. And uh, so, and we would go, and and I was I, that's kind of where I took up like speech and debate and drama. I was really involved mm-hmm. in those kind of type of uh, activities and. He would kind of coach us, so um, yeah, he's he's terrific. I mean, he has a theater in India as well, the Prithvi Theater, you know. Yeah, that's right, and his, um, his wife, and, dramatic actress uh, Ratna Patak. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a real artist, you know, and I think that's uh, that was, you know, a why he's so good, and and b uh, why you know he he did our movie essentially because he really didn't make a lot of money. So it was just because he loved to do the work, I guess. This movie, it's on Netflix for those, uh, yeah, who have that. So definitely check it out uh, to the listeners. Um, so so kind of maybe talk us through how you um, get involved with The Daily Show. Yeah. Um, well, The Daily Show is a strange odyssey in my life in the sense that, like, it was never something I intended to do. I mean, I, I write about this in my book. Um, you know, the it was the, the weirdest day of my life. I got this call basically saying, you know, um, I think the exact language that was – that my manager's assistant used was, the Daily Show is looking for a Middle Eastern-looking guy. <laughs> and um, – and I thought, wow, this is the most elaborate Homeland Security sting operation I've <laughs> ever heard of. <laughs> Not gonna go so well. The call gets, uh, yeah, it gets deported. <laughs> so I literally, I and then I said, and I thought, okay, so this is either gonna be that or it's gonna be like me, like I'd done like the voice of Saddam Hussein on David Letterman and tech support on Jimmy Kimmel. I thought this is gonna be another one of these gigs where I walk around with a fake beard yelling "Death to America" or, you know, sit on a to carpet with a turban pretending to fly or something. And so I said, no, uh, you know, I basically told the, I think I actually said, tell the daily show they <laughs> themselves. And I, <laughs> and, um, and they called back because, you know, uh, rejection works. And so they called <laughs> back and, uh, they said, no, actually, they're looking for a correspondent. So I was like, okay, fine, you know. And I didn't know how to do this. I didn't know what – I was a fan of The Daily Show. I, I watched The Daily Show and uh, John Stewart and all that. So I went down there. I just put on a suit and tie, went down there, and, and basically just did my best Stephen Colbert impression, <laughs> um, which is essentially what we all do on the show anyway, you know, is some version of, of, of Stephen Colbert. Um, and well, so, it's, uh, it's worked out pretty well for him. So yeah, yeah it's great. You know, I mean, you know, and, and because you know, Stephen is the person who sort of invented, is the archetype of that character, that sort of faux journalist, uh, arched kind of ironic uh, tone. You know, um, yeah. and the the type of questioning that he does in terms of those interviews and stuff. So it's all he kind of invented that style. So um, I just did an impression of him. And and happened to get the job and uh, was on the air that night. Wow! Uh, reporting from um, Lebanon, I think. Quote unquote. So uh, <laughs> yes, quote unquote. It was a, it was a very very quick flight. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, and and so I, and 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 that was the moment I think also when I realized that like there was something uh, to be said into the zeitgeist about 
from the pers- I should say from the perspective of someone like me, in the sense that, uh, and I and I and the book is kind of an extension of this. You know what I mean? The book is an extension of this ongoing uh, dialogue. I feel like I've been having with the culture at large right. uh, on the Daily Show, which is speaking about the culture. Um, from the perspective of being an insider and an outsider at the same time. I mean, when I got on The Daily Show, I was the first non-Caucasian correspondent on that show. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, full-time correspondent, right? Yeah. And so uh, the position that I was able to inhabit was a unique one. And uh, what I've tried to do in the book is is take that – which was, you know, uh, a perspective that I had speak from on The Daily Show and use that as a, as, as a way to actually talk more in depth about those same issues of identity and dislocation and culture and religion and all that stuff through the, in the book, um, you know, from a, a perspective of the same, of that kind of humor, uh, that Daily Show-esque kind of take, you know, but, from a, but a, in a more extended form. Well, and and I mean, when when we think when we when we sort of look at the, the chronology here, obviously uh, the, the Daily Show was was a pretty big uh, marker in ter- in your own personal timeline. At at what point now? Now you started it, you you were it, it was going to be like a one off or a short term gig, right? You you became a full time correspondent a little while later. Yeah, yeah. Initially, it was just a one time gig, and then and then after about four or five months trial period. Where John just basically kept having me back on the show and doing gigs and doing reports and stuff. I, I, and then at some point in, in the, the early part of the following year, they offered me a full-time contract. So at you know and and I, you know I read this article just last week that that you about you and and, and Dean Dean uh, Obedala about uh, how John Stewart made you more uh, Muslimish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. I'd love for you to unpack that a little bit. I mean, talk, talk about uh, that that sort of mini journey there. Right. Dean was just on um, our show, like the last episode. Yeah. Oh yeah, he, yeah. He, I think he he told me about that. Yeah, he um he, uh, you know, Dean read the book and 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 really that that article that was um I think it was on CNN.com or something, yeah, yeah. Um, which basically talks about how John Stewart made us both more Muslimish uh, is taken from the last chapter of my book, which is. Uh, called the jihadist of irony and um it is basically uh me talking about how i feel like i became the 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 the, the daily show ended up allowing me to have a voice and to speak into the culture on behalf of american muslims in a way that i never expected i mean when i got on the daily show my father was literally like how could john stewart do this you know like he had let he had let my father down in a big way, you know. Like, basically, <laughs> like he was like, how could John Stewart hire a bloody guy who doesn't know how to say salam to his parents to be a senior bloody Muslim correspondent? And it was, and I said, Dad, you know, look, it's a comedy show, and and he said, I hope it's a bloody comedy show because I can't see this him anybody taking you seriously, you know. Right. And, he was completely appalled by that whole idea, and uh, as was I, because as I've said many times, I'm not uh, I'm not the best example of a Muslim, uh, but culturally, yeah, I do yeah. come from that space, and so right. you know, there were a lot of things that like that that I felt like I was able to articulate. And again, I wasn't saying this by myself; it wasn't me writing it. This is why I talk about it in the book. I say, you know, The Daily Show became like my madrasa of comedy. Hmm. Uh, run mostly by Ivy League educated Jews Um, (laughs) and they helped me construct this character that I call the jihadist of irony Hmm. who basically was able to uh, you know, send uh, scud missiles of uh, of uh, irony and satire into the uh, culture by way of the Daily Show, you know, and say things that no one else was saying and so what happened uh, when I did that was that, you know, A, I, it started making me incredibly uncomfortable because suddenly I was being um, labeled as Muslim in some way, which I had never in my career, I didn't ever 
say I wasn't Muslim, but I'd never like openly been Muslim, you know? You didn't lead with that. I didn't lead with it, right? And now suddenly it was becoming a thing. And then, and then the other part of it was that I liked it because, because the part of me that is Muslim-ish uh, <laughs> was getting great satisfaction from being able to speak on behalf of, I don't know if we're making any difference in terms of policy or the war or you know, any kind of, uh, or, or in the media at large, but there was a way for me to speak on behalf of American Muslims. And I don't say me alone, like I, you know, like, but like there was a voice there that was missing and we were trying to fill that vacuum in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that was, you know, and also uh, Muslim people would come up to me on the streets and hug me and say, wow. Asalaamu Alaikum. And then they would say, would you like to meet my daughter? She's very pretty. <laughs> you should meet her, you know, uh, so they trying to get me married off. <laughs> so, um, you know, that was so like, yeah, so it kind of, it did sort of change my relationship uh, to my own craft and to my own, and what I wanted to say in the culture in some way, somewhat as well. Well, and, and uh, uh, you, you mentioned in, in the book and, and in the piece about how uh, what it came down to was John Stewart essentially saying, you're, you're all we've got. Yeah, well, now you gave away the ending of the book, dude. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, man, come on. <laughs> well, there's a twist. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I, you know, I found that. Uh, uh, no, um, yes, he did say there was a there was a moment in the book. I'm not going to uh, give it away too much, but uh, when it was around the Trey Parker Matt Stone thing, right? When the South Park portrayed the supposedly the image of Muhammad in a bear suit. I remember, there was the controversy yeah. about that. And there was a controversy around it, and I ended up getting on the air. And uh, and yes, there was an interesting conversation that John Stewart and I had around that, which, um, which is, which was kind of indicative of my, of of what my position in some way on on the show, and and it sort of etherized in that moment everything that was going on, and 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 how the Daily Show could speak to the the, the things from the position of having somebody like me, a, a sort of an American Muslim, quote unquote, on the show, you know. Well, I mean, it's you know, what what that particular moment. I found it incredibly, uh, uh, in a, in a way, poignant and, and relatable because I think that's what many many American Muslims have experienced in their own lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or it's that. It's you know whether I, I mean you're you're talking about your friends at the Daily Show, but whether you're talking about a law firm or you know an accounting firm, whatever. It's hey, Ahmed, you're you're the only guy I know. What, yeah with ISIS what's the you know and yeah the, the, you know that, that sense of uh, the individual suddenly taking ownership of the entirety of the, the Muslim experience. well that is I mean look that is part of the immigrant sort of narrative isn't it that you when you're a minority you end up uh, carrying the load on your back for everything that everyone feels about those people right right in whatever environment you are in and if you're on television it, it or whatever, it, it, it gets even, you know, uh, it becomes a little bit more acute. Um, so that is, yeah, I think that is a relatable experience. And I think that is true, you know, that like, I mean, I heard a statistic yesterday that said, I don't know if this is true, but, but I can't imagine it not being true, that 91% of Americans don't feel like they actually know a Muslim person. Sure. You know? And, uh, and so, yes, so... That one guy, you know, who is the Muslim guy on the on the floor of your office is the only Muslim guy you may come into contact with, you know. And so that person does end up representing everything. So every time there's something, ISIS does something, you know, you go over to like, you know, Abdul and, and be like, how do you feel about that? You know, what do you think? Like, how do you as if he somehow. Right. Has the end like he got the he's like well here's the thing see what now, I'll read from the memo that I got about how to respond to this right. <laughs> you're forced to like deal with these you know look I, I and, and and I experienced that also uh, not just on the Daily Show but even before when I was an actor before 9/11 before when I was a young actor mm -hmm. um, rep you know like having to represent being a brown guy or being South Asian. Uh, in like a, a TV commercial or a movie or a thing, and like always having to have asked that question of like, is this derogatory? Is this reductive? Is this something that my uh, that I'm gonna feel uh, ashamed of? You know, uh, of doing, even though I have to pay the rent. You know, so mm -hmm. 
that conversation and 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 then it was all so like but it was in in a weird way it's not fair because i'm i'm just an actor trying to make a living and my caucasian counterparts never had to deal with that kind of stuff you know they were like yeah sure i'll play whatever and and for me there was always the piece of it an extra piece of like am i culturally how am i representing my culture and my ethnicity and 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 people don't get that people don't they you know uh they don't necessarily always understand the the onus that is 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 uh, exists in that regard you know that is that's really profound yeah i never even considered even thought about that from the point of view of a performer but um but i think that you know just you being like i mean you're basically coming into people's living rooms essentially and just being the muslim guy like without even affirmatively talking about your faith or about your experiences i mean that i think is a huge step in the in terms of the history of this Islam in America and, and the Muslim experience in America. So, um, you know, kudos to you, really. Um, you know, well, and we you. I, mean, I mean, look, it, it, again, it's it's not something that it, it, it is it is um, it, it, you know, look, it's not something that I went out and was like, oh, I want yeah. to do this. I, like, it happened. The world happened, uh, and and you know, we all, in our own way, I think, are trying to. Um, uh, you know, have this conversation about, and this is the larger, you know, this is happening more and more. It's happening more now than it was actually after September 11th, you know, um, that this conversation about what is it uh, to be an American Muslim and, and, and uh, you know, uh, that question of identity, that question of, of um, you know, what is America? What is America's identity? What is the uh, what is the immigrant experience and all that stuff, which is something what I, I, I try to deal with in the book. It's stuff that, you know, like, for example, I, I, I like I said, I, like I've been dealing with on The Daily Show for a long time and then trying to examine those things in a more uh, with, with more depth and from a particular perspective of my own using my own life as kind of a template for that, that, that examination, you know, mm-hmm. now. No. Just in, in terms of some of the, the bits that you've done on The Daily Show, I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of when you went to, to uh, I think it was Murfreesboro for, for the, uh, the mosque project, and, and you, you talked to some people there. I think it was Murfreesboro in, in, in Tennessee. Um, and there was also the, the, the Muslim Batman story. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. What are, I mean, what have been sort of memorable moments within those larger experiences have you been surprised one way or the other either by people's negativity or or positivity i mean what, what have you come away with from from th- those types of experiences um you know what have what have i come away with is that uh there's america is is full of a lot of different kinds of people some of those people are uh, have very little information and access uh, to real information about, for example, in in this particular case, Islam. You know, but it could. But but you know, people. Say, I mean, look. The, the short answer is, um, <laughs> people say some crazy shit. You know, and 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 think some crazy shit. Um, yeah. But the reality is, they think it. They do really believe it. And. You know, there's a lot of propaganda out there. There's a lot of misinter- misrepresentation. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And, you know, when 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 I went to like Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and talked to that woman, and she said to me, you know, it was she was protesting the building of a mosque down in Murfreesboro, and she said um, one in five Muslims are terrorists. You know, and she got these statistics off the internet somewhere. Right. And I did the ma- and she said to me, do the math. So I did the math because I am Indian and I can do math. Oh, yeah. you know? um, and so she said, uh, oh, you know, I said, one in five Muslims are terrorists. And, she, and I said, oh, that makes about, you know, 300 million terrorists. And, uh, and she said, and she sort of looked at me kind of quizzically. And then I said, I can't understand what is taking us so long then in that case, you know, <laughs> if we have an army of 300 million, you know. Um, so, so that was great, you know, yeah. the absurdity of that kind of, of thinking, yeah. um, and again, you know, people, again, the, the statistic of 91% of people, Americans don't know a Muslim person is, is astounding and, and, uh, and, and, and furthers that, 
um, that kind of thinking, you know? Do, do you feel like, I mean, like this woman in particular, do you feel like you made a dent or was she just so sort of indentured in her cognitive dissonance that uh, it just kind of whizzed right by? Um, I don't think I made any dent at all. I think, I think that uh, she was surprised when the piece aired mm. he was getting hate mail not from muslims but from like america like regular americans like not not the muslims not regular americans but this like right. non muslims basically okay. um she was getting uh hate mail from from people she identified with and uh, and then she couldn't understand why that was happening so uh, you know that was probably her wake up call if there was one at all mm-hmm. uh-huh. When you talk about cognitive dissonance, I mean, that's got to, yeah, that's definitely got to be it. Uh, when you're getting, you know, that kind of hate mail. From, from yeah. people that, that yeah. are part of your that's cool. uh, that's right. click group. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's uh, obviously the uh, in, in the last month, there was a, a lot of controversy about uh, uh, when, when Bill Maher has sort of been, been going after uh, Islam in, in, in a way. That some people feel is, is a little bit excessive. He, he, he's uh, he's no fan of religion in general. Um, do you feel do you feel any pressure where that sense of like how how far can you go in in pushing the humor aspect? Do you, do you worry about offending uh, uh, Muslims, for example, by by virtue of incorporating uh, comedy and things like that? Um. I don't really worry about, you know, that's not, that's not a, um, I think, I think if you're going to say anything, you can't, you can't really worry about that. You've got to, you, you know, as an, as an artist, as a writer, um, as a performer, you know, you have to, you have to sort of speak whatever is your truth, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I've been involved in different projects where, you know, Muslims and non-Muslims alike have been offended uh, or felt like I wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, somehow addressing their particular agenda of the way they saw the world, you know. Um, and uh, listen, that is that is just the reality of of being an artist, being, a, you know, a writer. So I think you have to speak from your own experience and your own truth and, 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 and examine your own self. And in that examination, hopefully there is uh, an examination that happens out there in the, the, to the reader or to the viewer, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, you know, and, and we've had, you know, artists of different, like we've had screenwriters and stuff in the past and, you know, and we've made this comment where our art's messy, you know, I mean, you know, you're always going to run the risk of, you know, quote unquote offending you know, whether it's the establishment or or, or, or or orthodoxy or whatever may be the case, you know, but that's been sort of historically the case throughout Muslim history, I would even argue, where art's been messy and art, but our art has taken that responsibility of sort of pushing the envelope, you know? Well, and, and I think that that provides a very, very apt segue into talking about, about No Lands, man. I mean, this yeah. Uh, it, it, so it's, a, it's a collection of essays that, that represent your narrative in your words. Uh, I t- talk about how how we how how this came about. What what was the the impetus behind it? Um, you know, I had been writing a lot of. Uh, I mean, I wrote a one man show years ago, and I was writing monologues and stuff to to put together a new show, possibly. And uh, somebody approached me and said, "Hey, would you be interested in writing a book?" And I'd never done a book before, and I thought I could take these stories and um, turn them into more narrative forms. And what I what I what I've tried to do in the book is. Um, is in some ways is an extension of what I like I say what I've been doing on the Daily Show, which is that like to take these ideas of 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 um, uh, being an insider and an outsider and commenting on the experience of um, what it is to be an immigrant, mm-hmm. what it is uh, the issues of identity, of race, of dislocation, of of religious identity, mm-hmm. culturally and by virtue of faith or lack of faith thereof. Um, and and sort of examine those things in a larger in a in a more uh, in a longer format than like you know 15 seconds on the Daily Show, right? So you know, to, and using my life as a template to examine these themes and using narratives from my life, which I have exaggerated in some cases, or you know, or or like 
uh, tweaked in some ways in order to like talk about something larger that resonates in the culture. And also, look, I'm I'm a, I'm very fortunate in the sense that like I uh, dealt with the racism and the bigotry and the stuff that I dealt with to the degree that I dealt with it and um, have actually managed to be relatively successful in the culture. And okay. there is a story about how, about navigating through that because ultimately, you know, in the book I talk about how, you know, I was a kid who uh, was dealing with this kind of racism and bullying I was a kid in, in England and, you know, in boarding school in a British boarding school, which is like, you know, the worst place you can be. Um, and then, and then using like, you know, even pop culture icons like Michael Jackson, uh, you know, I was, I was a Michael Jackson impersonator in high school. And there's a funny story in the book about how I sort of was invisible when I got to America. When I got to America, like, you know, it was like you were either black or you were white, right? So, mm. or Hispanic. But if you were anything else, this was pre-9-11. This was, you know, like uh, Tampa, Florida was a city with one Indian restaurant. And wow. so, like, you were just basically invisible. And, right. uh, you know, I think I... I Nobody, and so I, I became a Michael Jackson impersonator because, partly because at that time both Michael Jackson and I, at 18 years old, looked like an Indian girl. So <laughs> therefore, <laughs> it felt like, like I could, you know, sort of, if I could dance like him and sort of sing like him a little bit, I could mimic that. I could, and so I, I used it as a way to get up on stage and perform and, and become a, a, a point of like, oh, you know, and I tell the story in the book about like how I use that as a way to find some kind of recognition to be to stop to not be invisible and playing with this idea of race mm -hmm. in my own life in the same way that michael jackson was playing with it in the culture on a much larger scale you know um uh and so uh you know that was um a uh, you know a real inflection point for me in, in in terms of my own um journey of like of like realizing um how to speak into the culture at large about uh, these these narratives about being an immigrant and I, and like I said I've been successful in the sense that like I was able to navigate that in some ways uh, and and find a place uh, 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 you know I, I you know as an actor you never feel like you're you've made it or whatever you know but um, but but I'm much I, I, I'm much more successful that in this business than I thought I would be and and that I think. Um, is uh, partly because of somehow how I absorbed the uh, the stuff that I dealt with uh, and what I did with it um, in, in, in transforming that into something, into art, into creativity, into uh, performance, into uh, speaking into the, the culture by virtue of The Daily Show. Um, and so, you know, that stuff, I think, is really, for me, what the book is about, is about sort of my examination of that immigrant story, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so much of what you, what you do talk about, I mean, resonates even for like, like someone like myself, who's like the, ch like the, a, a child of immigrants, you know, yeah, right. growing up in America, even though, you know, born here, but never really fully, you know, feel, you know, feeling a sense of belonging and, but then going back to India and feeling like you're a stranger there too. So really, right. well, that, that's that. And exactly. Hence the title, no land. I was going right? to say, so too. it's like, I mean, it literally like there's that sense of like not belonging anywhere and yeah. yet belonging everywhere, you know, right. right. Um, the sense of dislocation is I think something that is a shared experience to not only immigrants, but you know, first and maybe even second generation immigrants, you know, children. Yeah. I mean, I always have had that experience, you know, uh, of like, of like going to India and really, Realizing how Western I am. That's right. And 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 living in America, or or or, or even when I was a kid in Europe, but, but realizing how not American I am in some ways, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I've and I've and I've spent, you know, I've been here since the early '80s or whatever. But and and I enjoy many things that are American and 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 have absorbed a great deal of American culture. Uh, but there's, but, but I think because of my childhood, because of growing up in the UK, because of coming from a immigrant home, um, with a different language and culture and religion than say the friends that I went to high school with, mm -hmm. there, you know, the white kids I went to high school with specifically, um, there was always a sense of, of being one step removed from the culture in some way and trying to find and navigate a, um, an identity against that, you know? 
Hmm. I think another layer of uniqueness that you bring or, or your voice, you know, brings is that, you know, again, people, you know, we talk about monoliths, but we, you know, when, when we talk about the West or the Western experiences of the Muslim diaspora, that's not a monolithic experience whatsoever. Europe is very different than America. Yeah. England yeah. is very different than America in this case. Yeah. I mean, nothing is a monolith, right? Like, I mean, even the Western idea, the, even the Western experience is not a monolith, you know, like, like the idea of like England is a very different culture and has a different relationship to Muslims and to South Asians and to India in particular yeah. than America does. And, uh, Americans have a very different relationship, you know, uh, here, like for a long time, everyone thought I was Mexican when I first got to school, you know? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, um, I think that there's a definitely a, um, uh, yeah, none of this, you know, I, I hope that through specificity, however, of, you know, the only thing as an artist you can do or as a writer or whatever you can do is like you can speak about the specifics. Yeah. Use those specifics as a template to talk about larger things. And, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and I've attempted to do that in the book um, where, you know, I'm just taking my own, using my own life specifically in terms of like, oh, these are the things that happened to me. Like I was a Michael Jackson impersonator in high school. I, my father came to America because he heard about brunch and like, you know, was yeah. like obsessed with this idea of like, there was, you know, like my dad really did. He thought, oh, there's this third meal in America. Called what a concept. <laughs> he came here and I think somebody took him to have brunch. And he was like, that is a, in America, they have so much food. That day between breakfast and lunch, they have to stop and eat again. It's called lunch. <laughs> there was a third meal, which was 7.95, all you can eat. And so, you know, but that story is really about like this idea of a man who has been deprived of something his entire life and then comes to America. But then again, it twists, it turns on itself because it's a story also about like excess and consumerism, you know, yeah. um, which, which, uh, is again another another particular experience of of uh, not only my family but like but in terms of the of the narrative of America, you know. That's right. And being in a position to critique some of that because you your experiences are so unique. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, you know, that's where I I think the Daily Show has helped me. I think the Daily Show, being on the Daily Show for eight years, yeah, uh, allowed me to find a voice that was able to critique the culture from a place of um of affection in a way yes. you know yeah. i i love america like i think america's great i also think america is f-ed up <laughs> you know <laughs> um so uh you know it, it's kind of that thing right well, and, and the idea that those two thoughts are not mutually exclusive exactly and that those and and you know and for a long time i think american muslims especially after 9 11 were not allowed to have those two thoughts so, right they were not allowed and I talk about this in my book as well, which is this idea that the American Muslims were not allowed to be patriotic and critical of America at the same time. So true. Like, um, and, and, and I feel that, that being critical is, you know, is quintessentially American, right? Yeah, I mean, there is there, – exactly. And so I think, you know, when, when I – my work on The Daily Show, like, led me in some way as a natural evolution into this book, which mm-hmm. was that this book is really – for the first time, much more than anything else I've ever written, a real examination of the America of my American identity, you know, mm-hmm. and what it is to be an American and what it is to be a South Asian American, to be an American Muslim, to be, you know, um, to to be to have a complicated relationship with one's own faith within a culture um, of uh, that that you know has its own complicated relationship with the faith that you have a complicated relationship with, you know? So all of that stuff that I've been sort of kind of t- t- touching on through the Daily Show work, it, it then gets, ex- I felt like I, you know, tried to examine that stuff in this book on a larger, more uh, comedic, but also more resonant level, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the idea of, like you referred to, in, in, in those specificities, sort of achieving a universality in a way. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, just on a personal level, I mean, it's, for me, The Daily Show has, you know, like what I was talking about earlier, feeling comfortable with being American and at the same time being critical of some of America's excesses, whether it's here or abroad. I mean, The Daily Show has been a big part of that. And, you know, 
you know, I think that just having you on the no on the show is has just been such an honor. It, it really has. Um, Asif, I was wondering if you could uh, discuss. Uh, uh, you you had uh, talked about uh, continuing the the Cosby Show as as a web yes. series. Yes. Um, so has have recent events changed how you would tackle that particular project? Are you talking about the uh, the recent events of, of Bill Cosby? Yeah, I should say the the recent news because the events themselves are not exactly recent. Right, right. The recent news around Bill Cosby. So yes, I mean I think look the the show. Or the web series, I should say, uh, the Cosby Show, you know, Q U apostrophe S B Y, which is a parody of like sort of 80s American sitcom, you know. Yeah. What we've done is, for people who don't know, we we did this thing on the Daily Show, uh, which was basically taken from something Katie Couric said, which she said, you know, maybe American Muslims need their own Cosby Show in order to uh, alleviate some of the bigotry and hatred towards Muslims in the way that the Cosby show did for African Americans in the eighties. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, we took that notion and took it to its absurd level of like actually creating this all American family that is, uh, and, and the joke was that they're called the Q U apostrophe O S B Y show Cosby show. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, um, so we are, we are launching that early next year. Uh, we have an Indiegogo campaign that's going on right now. We, we, you know, there is talk. We, we, we may do a rebranding of it a little bit just because of recent news. Yeah. Um, however, uh, we are still uh, going to put it up and it's still going to go out. And, uh, you know, we are, we are not uh, – the show is not about Bill Cosby. It is about right. Right. Uh, fighting uh, Islamophobia and addressing Muslim bigotry, and it's using uh, the parody of an 80s sitcom. So it's as much parodying Family Ties or Growing Pains as, as it is the Cosby show, you know? Mm-hmm. The, um, the colorful it, sweaters notwithstanding, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> it was the 80s, you know what I mean? So That's right. Kind of that iconic American sitcom, but this time with a Muslim family, and the joke is that they are the most non-Muslim Muslim family in America, and, and uh, you know, but it addresses a lot of the issues in terms of uh, you know, profiling and uh, NYPD surveillance and, you know, various other things that Muslim Muslim communities deal with in America. All, all that good stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but, done, but done in a very funny uh, sitcom parody uh, that we, that we, you know, we've got terrific actors like Sakina Joffrey from House of Cards. I was say, yeah, the very talented Sakina Joffrey. Very talented Sakina Joffrey. You know from, he plays yeah. my wife. On the show, we've got guest appearances by Samantha B and uh, Jordan Klepper and um, and even um, uh, the Roots. So you know, it's it, we've got all kinds of uh, great stuff in there. Well, I mean, uh, uh, just as as we sort of wrap things up, uh, uh, the, the the book is out now. The book is out now. It's called No Lands Man. No Lands Man. I, I have it. I'm listening to the audiobook on my on my iPod. Uh, oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, you can take me around with you. Listen to it on the audiobook. Carry you in our pocket. You know. Carry me in your pocket. Exactly. Uh, it's available everywhere. Like where you know where books are sold. I guess. Right. And and, and, and also, you also have uh, the Brink uh, coming up. The I Brink need- is coming out next year in June. Uh, a very funny series uh, for HBO. Um, uh, Starring Tim Robbins, Jack Black, uh, Pablo Schreiber, uh, myself, John Larroquette, Carla Gugino, other people, a great, great cast. And it's a geopolitical, um, satirical comedy about um, global politics uh, seen through the eyes of three departments of U.S. government, seen through the State Department, the Foreign Service and the military. But it's uh, kind of a little bit like if uh, Homeland or 24 was a comedy. Yes. This is this is that show. Yes, which some would argue would, both have yeah. kind of become. <laughs> but, maybe, yeah, you know what? I I I, I I'm not going to offend the Homeland fans out there, but I, you know, <laughs> there, there may be an argument to be made for that. Uh, but yes, but this is much more um, in the tone of Doctor Strangelove or Mash, where mm-hmm. we're dealing that's with what, real. That my, I, I, that's what it seemed like to me when I read about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's dealing with real, and and of course, the first season, uh, the center of uh, of the story uh, takes place in Pakistan, and uh, so uh, that's where um, sort of the epicenter of the the story happens. 
Uh, but it's great and uh, great, very funny and uh, smart show that's going to be on HBO next year. Awesome. I'm very excited. Um, and then there's also the Indiegogo cam- campaign that you just mentioned for the Muslim Cosby show. Yes, exactly. So uh, you can go on uh, online and, uh, and and find that and, and donate to it. Um, yeah. we're, you know, we're trying to we're trying to raise uh, a few dollars there uh, to finish it up, and hopefully that will be out next year. Yeah. Well, great, and and it's it. Uh, we we definitely want to point out that you are talking to us uh, mere hours before the the uh, dinner for ISPU. Yeah, and um, that that's of course an organization that's doing a lot of good work. So um, we we really appreciate uh, you scheduling us in before uh, before that event as well. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, Asif, thank you so much for for coming on with us. Uh, this was thanks, guys. This is a blast for us. So we look forward to to hearing from you uh, even more as we continue. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Okay. Well. Uh, uh, again, big, big thanks to Asif Manvi and also for, for ISPU for, for facilitating that conversation, making it happen. Um, uh, Pervez, any, any thoughts on, on anything thus far? No, you know, I think, I think we, uh, we sort of covered it. Uh, again, very grateful to the, uh, to the kind of feedback we got from the last episode and we welcome your continued correspondence with us, your continuing correspondence with us uh, on this episode and future episodes. Um, where can people find us, Zucky? Well, we got we have a Facebook page. It is facebook.com slash diffused congruence. You can also email us, diffusedcongruence at gmail.com. Between the two of them, you should be able to hit us up. Also, write us a review on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Let us know how we're doing. And... Uh, uh, we, we've we've got some big stuff planned for for the next year. So with I, I don't want to give away the house yet, but if you stuck with us this long, uh, I, we're, we're extraordinarily grateful for it, and and we're, we're going to hopefully give you a lot more uh, to listen to in the, in the coming year. Yeah, that actually reminded me. You're right. This is going to be our last episode for this uh, for for the 2014 calendar year. It's been a wonderful year. Um, thank you, and uh, we look forward to uh, welcoming the new year with you again uh, in a few short weeks. Um, yep. I also did want to, you, you know, Zucky, you mentioned Facebook, and one of our, uh, I think, continuing, you know, continuing, uh, continuing listeners, I should say, uh, good folks who continue to join us, uh, Reza Hussein always engages us. I think is he a is he a friend of yours? Uh, uh, well, he he's a friend of all of ours, really, because he he he, he spreads the word about the show, and and that's uh, right. And yeah, he he's been he's been a, a diligent listener from the beginning. Yeah, that's right. So I wanted to give a special shout out to Reza. So thank you, Reza, for engaging us uh, always after every episode and for uh, spreading the news about our show. We really appreciate it. Give yourself a pat on the back. That's right. So till and next time, until next year. Uh, that's uh, that's signing off from me. Yeah, this is Diffuse Congruence. We'll see you next month. 